All right, we, if you're brand new, let me bring you up to speed real quick. All right, we have guests all the time. So, so we're, as a church, talking what's called kingdom economics. So if you're like, what does that mean? Yeah, we're talking about money, but, but I, I hope this will help. So I thought we would start the sermon off with a little bit of a math problem. Huh? Huh? Yeah? So yeah, this is my worst nightmare. But let's just see. Let, let me, this will not be too complicated. Just remember, uh, the guy preaching the sermon to college algebra twice. So, so don't, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, but I think we can do this. This is, uh, this is one rock, okay? Kind of looks like a chicken nugget, basically, but it's a rock. Plus, plus one rock uh, e- equals two rocks. Two rocks. I, I'm concerned. That was, a little, that was a little slower. And I know math has been t- taught differently, but I, but I okay. Okay, let's, let's do a, a much more difficult problem. Uh, we're using different numbers now. Uh, three balloons plus two balloons equals five balloons. So proud of you. So proud of you. So uh, this, this has a point. If you're, like, if you're new, you're like, this is a weird church. This is, I, did, I, did, I, thought, I thought there was a Bible they had talked about in Jesus and all that. But don't worry, so, so economics, right? Let's make this economical. You've got $1 plus $1 equals $2. So let's, let's have what they say is real talk. Sometimes you get the math right. One plus $1 equals $2. And if you're like Katie and I, we've experienced this, where you were right, you got the math right, but the math doesn't work still. It's, you got the $2, you counted it, you counted it, and that therein, there's your problem, where you felt like you counted it, and you didn't have, it was like this, I need, I need more of that, and, and I know the difficult part isn't counting it. I, I want to talk, in kingdom economics, you and I have to talk about this, because when you and I feel like, when you and I feel like there's not the right amount of money for us, you and I really struggle, and, and we should involve God in that. So I'm going to take you in to one of my favorite moments. This is one of the most popular, most, uh, I would say, repeated moments of Jesus when he feeds tons of people. Now, if you haven't heard the story, I just ruined the plot. But anyways, here we go. I want you to catch this because we're going to go slow. We're going to go slow through this. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people. He was testing Philip for he had already, he already knew what he was going to do. If you want to know how Jesus thought, he already knew. So here, keep. He was, he was testing Philip. That is one of those like, what's the cue here? These four words, I'm trying to count them. Uh, he was testing Philip because you know what? He was testing Philip and That's the deep part of it. See, Jesus is about to do a miracle, and oftentimes we forget in the midst of the miracle because it wows us. We forget what the whole thing was for. And Jesus notices, he's been told that people don't have the food, so he goes and asks a question that he knows the right answer to. Hence, a test that you might also be in right now. That's my point. So let's go to, uh, let's go to verse 7. Take us to verse 7. Philip replied, uh, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed him. Do you see how he did the math? It's one of those like, oh. Some of us are like, I like Philip. Philip thinks like me. Like where there's a problem. And he's like, okay, boom, 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 boom. Um, hey, uh, Jesus so uh, if he's doing the math and the amount of people there, he's like, okay, we're, he's, you can think he's, this cost, okay, we have to go pay for this and this and this. And he says, we don't have enough money to feed them. You likely, at some point in your life, have felt like this, where you said, we don't have enough. But that's not the end of it either. That's why we gotta go slow, go slow. Verse eight and nine. Then Andrew, this is a different guy, Simon Peter's brother spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. It feels like he's fixed the problem. I've got it. I've got it fixed. Oh, but what good is it that, you know, with this huge crowd? <laughs> he's the guy that comes up with the idea that most people would say, that was a stupid idea, man. Like, like I, I understand 
this young kid has lunch. I think he's trying to contribute. You've been in a meeting like this where someone tries to contribute and you're like, yeah, that didn't help the whole problem. This is what he does. He's like, hey, so there's this kid with this, uh, this, this lunch of some sort, but then, like, then he thinks out loud, oh, uh, but we got thousands of people. Here's what I'm talking to you about. Scarcity. When you and I as a church talk about kingdom economics, like what does it mean to, to do money Jesus' way, where your money, the way you handle money, glorifies the Almighty? Like how do you do that? You got to talk about scarcity because if you're any sense of like normal, scarcity at some point in your life has affected you. You felt it. I, I, have, a, I have a very good example of this. I, Some of you are still hoarding this stuff. <laughs> this is crazy. Now, for those of you who will feel like I'm being insensitive about what I'm going to talk about, just so you know, I want to talk about COVID-19. Was COVID-19 real? Yes, yes. Yeah, but, but I'll, let's just talk about this. When we learned about what COVID-19 was doing, most of us were watching the news and we were somewhat afraid or like intimidated by what was going on. So we're like, okay, what's going on? And eventually it led us to do very rational things like go to grocery stores and big box stores and buy all the toilet paper. Think about how now, now that we've been through this, can we kind of laugh at ourselves a little bit and be like, how weird that we were buying toilet but like you, you place like this that we're putting signs up that's what those signs are like hey limit limited one and my parents still and they'll get mad at me for telling you this they have quite a bit of toilet paper in the garage <laughs> quite a bit uh i did some research on this i know that sounds weird but it's kind of how i think uh in australia let's pick on australia <laughs> in australia the newspaper during covid19 one particular newspaper decided to print eight extra pages to the newspaper with no ink on it. I'm going to let you figure out why. When the newspaper is like, we have a major problem and we've got paper that we're going to get you, we're going to get you eight pages of newspaper for you not for making fire uh you here's paper but you we, do we we remember this right we remember this and some of us are still kind of we feel this right in south dakota you know the first snowstorm all that kind of stuff all of a sudden everything is cleared out see scarcity affects you and i i'm just saying it, we know the feeling of scarcity when it happens to your bank account it even amps up a little bit more right so scarcity principle, if you, if you forgot economics class, this is very simple, I'm not gonna go too in depth. Limited supply plus high demand. Limited supply, like you don't have enough, but you need enough. This is why some of you pack 75 pairs of underwear in, in, a, in a suitcase when you go on a trip for three days. So you're like, it's, it's a bit of a fear. I, I know what you do, I'm not looking at you, but uh, <laughs> stress, lack of confidence. When, when, Scarcity principle talks about that what happens when you feel scarcity Well, all of a sudden the confidence that you had in the previous moment where you didn't feel the scarcity your confidence has all of a sudden Diminished by some level some percentage and all of a sudden your stress is up because you're concerned with will I Have enough And so the short term right the short term gets everything. It's like scrap all of our long-term plans. We're now in what's called survival mode. That's what happens. Scarcity leads to I'm scared, I'm intimidated, I'm stressed, and so I'm in survival mode. And I'm going to tell you, in our nation right now, I'm not getting political, but in a, in a time of where there's, a, there's an election, there's inflation, there's all this different stuff, you and I have got to talk about this. Because this is going to be a rather... I would say exciting year, but I'm not sure. But like, in, uh, like this is going to be a year where you and I are in danger of not worshiping God with how we manage money. And scarcity is coming for you in some way, whether it's a news headline that's maybe not even true, or maybe it's very true. Maybe you will get laid off. Maybe you will have some sort of unexpected expense, right? So you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, need to deal with a key statement. The statement is what the disciples were bringing up. Very simple. There isn't 
enough. What, if you're a follower of Jesus, what are you doing with that? Because there's important principles behind that. First one, very simple. (laughs) A follower of Jesus doesn't ignore reality. Sometimes it's like, yeah, I know what Christians do. Stick your head in the sand and just hope that that God sprinkles some dust on your finances and all of a sudden you just, no, 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 no. I've already been showing you this parable. Do you notice how they're not ignoring reality? I think that's important to bring up. How they're not going, you know what, we don't care. We don't have food, but we just know. We just know it's going to happen. And I don't know how it's going to happen. They're, we have enough food. No, you don't. They don't have enough. They're right. They're, they're absolutely correct. There's not enough food for the thousands of people. Your response, if you're a follower of Jesus, is not to look at scarcity or lack of and say, I'm going to ignore it till something changes. No. A follower of Jesus doesn't ignore reality, but here, but also isn't restricted to reality. That's, that's the major turning point. This is where we lose some people because you're like, oh, that seems a little like hocus pocus kind of, and it's not, it's not. But a follower of Jesus says, yep, this is so true. Lots of bills, high expenses, maybe your job is doing great, whatever. Doesn't ignore reality, but knows that reality, what you and I see, isn't all that God is bound to. So with that in mind, let's go back into the story. Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. If that's weird to you, like, why do the men only count? Well, that's, we're, if this is a different era, but here's what you need to learn from this. The men alone, key words there, there's 5,000 men there. I, I, assure, I assure you, there were women and children there as well. So if you want to know how many people don't have enough food, it's over 5,000. It's a basic story problem. You remember these? I'm just, uh, I don't know how many. You could say 10,000 maybe. You could say 15,000. Some theologians say 20,000. That's not, that's not even get, let's just stay conservative. Over 5,000, okay? Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish. And we just missed. You may not have caught it. We just missed a major, major, major principle written in Scripture, a part of the story, because many of us are like 5,000. We're numbers people. We're thinking about they're hungry. Jesus is about to do the miraculous. You know who doesn't get a bunch of uh, airtime? Is whoever in the world that young boy was. I don't know who he was. I don't know his name. But this young boy... Started the morning off, I think. I I started the morning off. I don't know if someone helped him. I don't know what his family life was like. I don't know any of that. Maybe he made it himself. Maybe his mom, his dad, his grandma. I don't know who made it. But he's got got a little bit of food that in theory is going to take care of him for the day. But all of a sudden, he's in a moment with apparently a large crowd who is starving, who maybe is a little hangry, right? And they're in this moment. And all of a sudden, these men older than the young boy are eyeing his lunch, his dinner, his whatever that is, and they're like, this kid's got something, and he's like, don't know, right? But that's not what he did. What you and I often miss is how profound it is that this young boy, seemingly without a fight, without much convincing, takes all of his food and hands it over to Jesus. And there is such a big, if scarcity stresses you out, don't miss this. Here's the lesson. Don't ask God to bless what you're unwilling to give him. If you want to know one of the things that we often just skip right over, many of us are praying to God at multiple, here, can I, can I confess? I have asked God multiple times in my life, God, would you, would you bless me, my finances, my this, my that? Would you, would you shower favor upon me and my family? But be careful if you're asking God to bless what he's not allowed to touch. It's a tough principle to learn. 
Because some of us are like, but I won't have enough. I understand. That's why there's something bigger at stake here. If you want to have victory over the fear and stress of scarcity, you take a powerful story like this and say, have I let, have I let God put his hands on my money? Does he get any access or do I want him to bless me from afar, send a check in the mail, and that's not really have any personal interaction. Like, what's your approach to God? Jesus Jesus got really frustrated with some religious leaders once who were actually not having a problem with this. They were having another problem, but I'm gonna show you something. I think it's helpful. Matthew 23, 23. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? And he calls them hypocrites. You call religious leaders hypocrites, right? You would struggle with this. David, you better practice what you preach kind of stuff. Don't be a hypocrite, right? You, hypocrites. For you are careful to tithe. I've talked about this, but tithe is a, it's a mathematical term. It's 10%. They're giving 10% of whatever money comes into their life. They're giving 10% back to God. That's why he says, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. If you're like, what? There's side hustle, if you need better terminology. If you want to know, like, like, like we know nowadays, like side hustles, your second business, your third business, your, your Facebook marketplace, your whatever, like this is their Facebook marketplace, they're selling herbs. For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income, even from your second source or third source of income, but you ignore more important aspects of the law. Justice, mercy, and faith. They were giving to God, they were trusting God with their money, but they were robbing others of mercy and justice. They saw injustice all over the place. In fact, if you study, many of these folks were actually doing their own act of injustice in it. It was very toxic, very bad. So they're not doing what they should. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. There's a lot to learn from here. One is, does Jesus ever talk about tithing? Um, mm -hmm. Does Jesus ever say you should tithe? Uh-huh. But there's also another lesson here we often miss. This culture in this particular moment does not appear to have a major difficulty with tithing. He commends them for their tithing. If you read uh, the New Testament, you'll read often that the early church was actually well known for their generosity to God. They were pouring money into their local church to help the poor to do a lot of great things. That was not apparently in this moment the struggle. Their struggle was they were, they were not showing mercy. And, and Jesus brings up, you want to know what's important is mercy is a big stinking deal. What I think is interesting, can I, I'll give you a pastoral observation. I think in today's culture, we flop this. To where in our culture now, we're very justice oriented. Like we're, we're if, you, if you talk about the younger generations, one of the great gifts of the younger generations, they now care about injustice, unlike some other generations did. It's incredible, it's awesome. Mercy and justice, those kinds of things, we're like, yeah, we got that faith, I got faith in God. Nowadays, Christians are like, but my money, especially in America, my money, no, I'm not going to trust you with that. I'm just going to make sure that everyone gets what they need, right? It, it's interesting how it's flip-flopped. And you and I have to wonder, could that be that we've responded to scarcity in ways we shouldn't have? Has scarcity caused us, I know I would use this term, to hold on to certain things like the religious leaders were holding on to justice and mercy? Let's go back into this. So he does the miracle, and, and, and they all ate as much as they wanted. If I was in that party, I just want you to know, I would have eaten a lot. <laughs> After everyone was full. Don't, see, well, you need to read this a little slowly. Like, so just a little bit of bread, a little bit of fish. They distribute it. Remember how it started, remember? There's not enough? It's impossible? Well, apparently... Uh, after everyone was full, everyone, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. Can you imagine what it would have been like as a disciple? You got this basket and you're going back around to the people that you gave food to that you're still going, I can't believe I was, there was still food for all of you. And now you're getting leftovers you're like this does not make any sense what's happening right now. And it started with a boy who was like, 
Here you go. You and I, I think, you know, the hardest part with money and scarcity? God, here you go. And if you want to know how much, David, is here you go, I'm going to start off with 100%. 100% of everything you have in your hands that you own is God's. And he would like you to manage it and steward it his way. So here's the point. Kingdom economics, what do you do in the midst of scarcity? How do you fight scarcity? Manage money God's way. I know it sounds basic. In fact, I'm annoyed with how basic what I just said. I'm annoyed by it. So I'm so annoyed by it. Just imagine me typing at a computer, writing a sermon like, God, share with me what you want shared. And okay, well, that's really annoying, God. That seems very basic. And then he's like, well, and I just begin processing, well, then maybe we need to go just a slight, a slight little trail here. Can I take you on just a slight trail? Because what I'm about to share with you is very basic. I, in fact, I'm pretty confident that every one of us will have heard what I'm about to share. So I thought, okay, how do we handle what's about to be shared here? Stages of application if you've never been taught this. Do I know this? Do I do this? Do I teach this? I'm about to share something that some of you are like, I know it. Some of you are like, and I'm trying to do it. Some of you know it, you do it, and you're, but you need to teach it. So I want you to see, yeah, what I'm going to share with you, some of you are like, I've never heard that before, David. I, I didn't know those verses. I, did, I didn't know that was said that. This is all brand new information. Thank you for helping me know this. If you already know it, once you know it, then you're like, do I do this? Do I apply this? Scripture teaches that information plus application is transformation, right? So you and I, don't, so this is the stages. And then once you know it and you're doing it, then it becomes not only are you a disciple, but are you making a disciple? Are you teaching it to your friends? Sometimes to your spouse, that has those kinds of conversations. Are you teaching it to a small group? Are you teaching it to your kids? So there, now, now I feel better. I feel personally better. Let's go into God's way. God's way, make a plan which is a budget. Now if you're like, basic. Let me tell you why it may not be near as basic. Let me show you some stats. Three in five, 67% have no idea how much they spent last month. These are American stats, by the way. Three in five, 67%, can't go back to last month. And some of us are like, am I supposed to be able to go back to, yeah, you're supposed to be able to go back to last month and have an account for what you spent. Now, here's what's even more fun to look at if you want to nerd, because some of you are like, oh, I can't believe this. And some of you are like, I've never heard about a budget. So here, listen, listen. Here's generational stats. And this I find fascinating. Here's the folks who know what they spent, okay? You begin to go, oh, now I know what's going on. If you don't know much about generations and things like that, this is the younger crew. I'm not hating on you. In fact, here's, here's what I see when I see this. Can I, I'm going to tell you what I see. Here's what I see. I see that the older you get, the more you realize knowing how much money you spent is crucial. That's what I see. Not that these folks are like, how do you not know this? Because some of us have to remember how we were when we were teenagers. And, and it's, what we learn here is maybe we know the information, but it takes us some experiences and stuff to begin to apply the information. That's why it's crucial for you and I to say, oh, I know I should do a budget and move a little bit further and say, I will do a budget. I, like I, I will. I'm, I'm going to start this earlier. I, just, just, these are, these are tips. Um, uh, here, let me, let me show you some scripture that if you, this isn't just like Dave Ramsey course or what, I, I, what, notice something that, that happens here with, with Jesus. And this isn't really about money, but notice how he teaches what, what he, what he assumes onto you and I, but don't begin until you count the cost. He's talking about following him. Like, this is a deep spiritual pass, pass, like passage, like, like, hey, like, I want you to follow me. I want you to devote your life to me. So that's what he's talking about. Consider, consider the cost. For, for who would be construction on a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? That sounds like a budget. Do you see what he kind of just assumes in the midst of following him? Like, how everyone in the crowd would have been like, oh, budget, yeah, yeah, that's... 
Yeah, we would, you see what he assumes on them, but I'm not sure that our, our culture sees this as a spiritual principle. But it is. Otherwise, uh, you might complete only the foundation before running out of the money and then everyone would laugh at you and they would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Uh, most of us would say, yeah, I don't want to be that person. Look at what Jesus just did. He brings up a very cultural, powerful principle that you and I should know where we spend our money because it's being spent. <laughs> Proverbs 21, 20. The wise have wealth and luxury, but, but fools spend whatever they get. I'm not, I'm not hating at all. I, I'm just telling you, in the Bible it says if you want to not have like scarcity and problems in this world make you lose your mind, then you're going to start doing a budget. So um, I thought, because I'm, I'm, I'm still a dad, so i like, well, we got to have examples here. Like, how, what, what does the Bible teach? And I'll, I'll summarize the Bible for you on, on this. This is basic. This is super basic. This is not all-inclusive here. So, so here, here. If, if, if you could, and you could create more buckets to this, but this is what the Bible would essentially teach you, that if you want to know, like, what's a budget? What, what do I put in the budget? What website do I go to? What, what major person that's out there? What do I listen? Here, this is, this is, this is super basic. What you, you know is, you're like, uh-huh, yeah. This is not the only part of a budget, according to the Word of God. Most of us think, oh, it's, it's spending. No, 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 no. There's this weird one. This is, sometimes this could be invest. And then there's this one. I want to talk to you about, do you know the Bible talks about how to do this, though? That's important. Acts 20, 35 you should remember the words of the Lord Jesus, if you want to know who's saying this. It is more blessed to give than to receive. I bet many of us have quoted this accidentally, didn't know maybe the reference, but you've said it. Or you felt this way. Most of us would say, I would agree with that, that it's better to give than receive. So bring that back and plug this in. So does your budget indicate that it's better to give than to receive? Because if it's better to give than to receive, that makes an order to your budget, if it's better. Meaning, if it's better to give than to receive, you don't function this way. If it's better to give than to receive. If it's better, if it's better, if it's better, then this is your priority. It's where you would say, it's better to give than receive, and I want to spend my life that way. And here's what you can learn. You might know this. Sustainable generosity, this is important, starts with purposeful planning. Some of us are like, no, I'm just playing the lottery hoping, right? It, uh, uh, my dad plays or does the, the Reader's Digest sweepstakes. I don't even know what it's really called. And, and he promises that one day, one day, right? And, and, and they're generous, and that's a whole side thing. But some of us are waiting on an abnormal, amazing blessing to then become that generous person. And I would say generosity is more who is sustainably doing it. And how do you do this in sustainable ways? You make it a priority. Uh, I already read this to you, Matthew six twenty one in this series. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. First line item in your budget. I assure you, if you want to know what it means to follow, to follow God, this is first. I know I did a whole sermon on this. You can go, but I want you to see that sometimes, can I show you the temptation? Oh, let me do this. This might not be your temptation. Let me show you my temptation. My temptation was to look at what this was going to do and then interchange this stuff a little bit. What I would tell you according to God, not according to David, not according to Fountain Springs Church, according to God, huh, these are interchangeable. That might sound weird. I know some of you are like Dave Ramsey and you're, just, you're mad now. You're like, that's not what Dave Ramsey says. <laughs> according to the word of God, these often move around based on what's going on in life, what you're investing in, what you're fixing, these often, according to the word of God, this does not move. Why? I think it's because of scarcity. 
Who do you want to trust in the midst of scarcity? All I'm teaching you, my job is not to convince you, it's to show you what the Word of God says. 2 Corinthians. Remember this, the farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your own heart how much to give. This sounds fun because we're like, okay. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure and a fun one. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Welcome to as a kid going, then I'm not giving because I can't be cheerful about it, right? This is, okay. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. I want you to see the agenda God has with money. Do you see what God, why you and I actually get the chance to be stewards of money? It's not so that we will be stressed out in all of our lives. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. Doesn't that sound like a fantastic way of life? Proverbs 3, 9. Honor the Lord, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part, the best part of everything you produce. The best part, that's what we give to God, which means here's where the sermon basically lands. As our word of the year is disciple and kingdom economics and scarcity, a fan wants to trust God. A follower works to trust God. And if you've ever budgeted, This is work. This is weekly, monthly, annoying stuff. Like, I wish you would nod your heads a little bit more because now I feel like it's just Katie and I. This this is, depending on what's going on, what breaks, what you're going through, and all the type of stuff, what money you're making, all that kind of stuff. This This is a big time commitment. I get this. But when you get this right, scarcity can't win over you. You don't become the person that lives this way, right? Scarcity can happen and say, ah, we're already doing it God's way. And maybe the math doesn't work out this month, but we're doing it God's way. And he can multiply things. And you're not even wishful thinking. You're just following the promises of God. Doesn't that sound like a way of life that Jesus invited us into? So our language at this church how do I get this rolling? How, do I, how does it begin to happen? Here, here's our, and it's, it's, it's our language as a church, I'll tell you. Uh, nothing to something, something to scheduled, scheduled to sacrificial. Like, how do you make steps? We always talk about next steps and things like that. How do you get rolling? Well, you make sure that you look at, am I doing zero? Am I, am, do I even have a budget? And if you don't, go from nothing <laughs> to something. And be like, what if it's a budget that's not good? Who cares, Rayleigh? Who cares? Just go to put something on paper and, and look at your expenses and your income and just, even if it's a mess and you need someone who knows how to count to help you, just like put it there. Move from nothing to something. Then, then you begin to look at scheduled and you begin to say, what do we do regularly? How do we do this? And, and then you look at, what if the way of life that we had, what if the decisions that we, the yeses that we say yes to and the no that we say no to What if that was all rooted in putting as much in this bucket so the poor, so the needy, so that whatever the Lord wants to do is fully funded and has what it needs? I think that's what God always intended. But you gotta start somewhere. So this is your marching orders, your homework for the week. Look at that, look at where you're at. Um, We're gonna, you've been hearing about this, this, this 40 days leading into Easter. What if, I don't know if you do Lent. Some people are like, I don't, I don't do that. Uh, what, if, what if in this Lent time and, and something you gave up or something you applied was you applied some of this stuff? And you say, you know what? I want to do economics the way that honors Jesus Christ. And so I want prayer over this and I'm going to apply this for 40 days and, and just see what God does and see how this plays out. This could be a great way to be a part of that whole 40 days with us as a church. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, this is big time stuff. Uh, I think it's why you, you taught on it all the time. You've spoken to us a bunch about it, Lord. And, and frankly, many of us, this is the, the topic. This is the, the fears, the stress, the worries, the things that we think about, Lord, oftentimes go back to some sort of financial something. So Lord, I ask that your spirit 
would press into our lives so much that, Lord, that we'd be open to do things your way? Lord, would you help us say, if we have hard hearts about it, if we have our minds already made up, Lord, would you soften us up a little bit and help us just to be willing to, to trust you, to, to want what you want, to do what you say to do? Lord, I, I pray that you would challenge some folks, even this week, to teach this to someone, to just share it with someone, and may, maybe they'll feel weird about it, but Lord, would you give them the courage just to share it with someone about, about doing this your way, Lord? But use us as a church, God, in, in one of the major stress points, the things that tears marriages apart and, and families apart. God, we don't want to be that kind of church. We want to be a church that thrives because we do it your way. So Lord, we ask for your help this week. Help us to run from zero. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.